Yeah, I know you're a gamer, a big time gamer. Hey, before I forget, let me just make sure you're aware that um, on, at the Welcome Center as you leave, we've got our annual report for the church. Um, I don't know if you know this, but a church um, has a, something we call constitution and bylaws. And by our bylaws say that a week before our annual business meeting, um, you need to make, we need to have this available to you. So it's just some financial reports in there, just some basic information. And our business meeting is next Sunday at two o'clock at Washington. And so, man, I encourage you, if you're a member, definitely come because listen, you're a member, right? Like you're a member. Do I, I don't think I need to explain membership any more than that. But if you're not a member and you just call Livestream Church your home, you're also welcome to join us. So make sure that you plan that. And one other thing I'd like to encourage people to do next Sunday is let's go out for some lunch. You know, if you've got some people that you love and that you just don't hang out with enough, Sunday afternoon we get out around 1130. The business meeting starts at 2. Like grab some people and go to lunch. Can we, can we just agree we're going to just do that? Say yes. Everyone say yes now. Thank you, man. I try to encourage you, but then I'll just go to bullying if you're just not going to gonna reply to me. <coughs> All right. So, um, so raise your hand again if you're a gamer. Got a gamer. Get up. Sit up, boy. Come on. What are you doing? All right. Scott, you're a gamer. Gamers over here. Gamers in the house. Doing puzzles on your phone is not being a gamer, but whatever. Um, I am not a gamer in the sense of a video game person. I just don't care. Really, that's just the truth. On my phone, I have checkers. Not joking, that's how lame I am. I have checkers and spades. Like, that's it. And I will rarely play those because I just find, found myself wasting time. But I will make a confession to you today. You ready for a confession? They say it's good for the soul. No, so not Fortnite, Minecraft. I've never, I don't even know how to play. I don't know anything about them. But I did get into playing, I feel ashamed to admit it, but I'm just going to do it, Candy Crush. Oh, my word. There was a season. I know. There was a season where I got into Candy Crush. And it's like, I don't care if you all need to be fed. I don't care if we don't have clean clothes. I have one more life. I have 60 minutes to play all that I want. Unlimited play, unlimited lives. You know what I mean? Like that Candy Crush, it kind of, it kind of got me for a little bit. And here's what actually happened. There was a man in our church who, I didn't understand that if you logged in on, as your Facebook login information, that people could see what you were doing. And there was a gentleman who came to me and he's like, I see you're at level 42. And I'm like, oh no, this is private. My Candy Crush is between me and the Lord. And that day, like, I deleted Candy Crush off my phone because I just realized, I don't know why I'm a little bit private with some things. Other things I'm way too open about. But that day I just realized, like, I don't want people to know I play Candy Crush for some weird reason. And I don't play it, and I feel set free. You know what I mean? Like, I just feel freedom. But what was interesting in Candy Crush, what's interesting in the video game world, is that you, the general rule of thumb is that you get three lives. Remember when Pac-Man came out? Galaga. Yeah, all those games. Frogger, Frogger, Pong, wasn't that like the first one line? Pong, whatever. I, I'm too old. I'm too young to remember Pong, but Pac-Man, oh yes. You got three lives. And that um, gamers and game creators kind of realized that that was the perfect number. Because your first life, you could be a little careless with. You know, you could... It was good for new players because they could learn the game. If they made a mistake, they got another life. It was good for people who wanted to be a little bit more aggressive in gameplay because if they died, they got another chance. But man, once you got to, you, you killed your second life, you knew it was do or die. Like you really had to step up your game. And so as we, there is a point to this, by the way. It's not a sermon about video games, but the point being, listen, that in this life, we have one shot. I don't get three lives to live. 
I get one life to live, and I want to make it count. So we are studying for the next seven weeks. We're studying the books of First and Second Thessalonians. And this theme, we're going to see run throughout these books of living ready. Paul is writing this letter to the church in Thessalonica, encouraging them to live lives that they are ready, that they are ready at any moment, that you don't get two shots, you don't get three shots. Like, if I leave this place and, God forbid, I get in a crash and die, that's it. Like, I don't get to, like, just kind of wake up and start over where I left off or start at the beginning. I've got one life, and I want to make it count for the Lord. So listen, we're going to be talking in this series about living ready. We're going to talk about ready to rise. Today, we're talking about ready to rise. And what I mean by that, ready to rise like cream, how if you have unpasteurized milk, that cream rises to the top like the good stuff rises to the top. We want to be a church that is exemplary. Exemplary. We want to be ready to rise. We're going to talk about being ready to lead, ready to endure, ready to sanctify, ready to depart, ready for reward, ready for tribulation, and ready to work. And I, this is causing a shadow. So we're going to talk about being ready and living lives that are ready. So I just want to start with prayer. Let's do this. Lord, this morning we come before you and we want you to speak to us so clearly, so powerfully through your word. We believe that your word has power to change our lives. It has power to direct our lives. And so, Lord, we're going to listen to your word. We're going to lean into what you want to teach us as we study these books. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, so I don't know about you, but when we walk through First and Second Peter, like I just, man, I got such a beautiful picture out of six or seven, eight weeks that we walked through those books. I understood that book so clearly. Like there are passages now that if I'm struggling with something, I know that I can go to those books because I remember where some of those verses are. So let's talk through kind of giving you a foundation for the book of First and Second Thessalonians. So what do we know? Right? That's a good place. What do we know? We know the author was the Apostle Paul. We know that Paul was converted. He met Jesus when he was approximately 30 years old, when he was on the road to Damascus. He has this amazing God encounter that rocked his world, changed his life, changed the course of human history. Pretty, I mean, to me, that's pretty amazing that thousands of years later, we're still talking about what Paul saw, what he did, what he wrote. Like, that's powerful that he changed the course of history. At 30 years old, he meets with Jesus. This book is written when he's approximately 45 years old. So why do I say that? Here's what we know. <clears throat> he's walked with Jesus for 15 years. At this point, he's a seasoned person. He's not a new Christian. He's not a baby pastor, right? He's not a new evangelist. Like, he's got some steel in his spine and some grit in his spit. He has walked with the Lord, and he knows his stuff now, okay? He knows what it means to be ready to lead, ready to rise. At this point in his writing, like, we can listen to him and know he's not a newbie. Let's take what he's saying. So what do we know? Who are the recipients? The church, church in Thessalonica, which actually wasn't even a church at the beginning. Paul goes there. Listen how cool this is. You can layer Acts chapter 17. I challenge you to do this. Read Acts chapter 17 and then start reading 1 Thessalonians. And you're going to get a picture of how this church in Thessalonica started because we learn all about it in Acts chapter 17, okay? We know the backstory by looking at that. Here's what we know. After three weeks, three weeks is all it took for Paul to minister in this city he goes and he ministers in the synagogue. He ministers to people on the streets. Three Sundays is what the Bible tells us. He was there for three Sundays, so it could have been 21 days. It could have been 25 days. But in that range, there was three Sundays that he was there before he was run out of town. But in that three weeks, listen to how powerful his ministry was. The church was started after three weeks of ministry. Y'all want to know something? If we want to start a church plant in our communities, we're gonna, <clears throat> wouldn't it be amazing if it took three weeks? But it doesn't take three weeks nowadays. And it makes me wonder why. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I'm, I'm questioning, like, why, why, 
why not do what Paul did? But if we want to get the results Paul got, we got to do some of the things he did. You know what I mean? Like, he was passionate. His whole life was given up in ministry to other people. So if you want to start a church now, you're going to have to do studies in the area. You're going to have to know the, the city, the layout. What type of people are they? Are they a rural people? Are they more of an urban people? You're going to have to really do studies nowadays. But that wasn't the case for Paul. He just went and he talked about Jesus. He did it in the power of the Holy Spirit. And people were drawn. People started coming to this church. And three weeks later, Paul, Silas, and Timothy are run out of town, but a thriving church remains. Isn't that cool? Thank you, Bobby and Ruby. Let's do it. Isn't that cool? So amazing to me. Listen, here's what else we know about this church. In Acts 17, verse 7, we know that the Christians that were left behind in Thessalonica were accused of blaspheming Caesar because they said that Jesus Christ is king. That's blasphemy in their culture. They, like, they were under threat of persecution because they took such a stand that Jesus is king. Caesar's a king, but Jesus is king. King. So Thessalonica was a bustling seaport town, over 200,000 people. Like, that's a big city, isn't it? That's like Lonnie, when Lonnie and I first met, I'll just tell you this quick. We, we first met and um, he was asking me about what kind of town I grew up in. I said, oh, it was a small town. And so it piqued his interest. He's like, oh, okay. Um, he's like, I grew up in a small town too of about 482 people. <laughs> I, was like, I didn't know those things existed except in Mayberry, you know. And he said, how, how big was yours? I said, it was about 125,000 people. You know, because in my mind, that was a small town because we were right outside of Nashville. And so Clarksville felt like a small city. And he informed me, he said, you can never tell people that you grew up in a small town again. Like, <clears throat> that was a big town. 200,000 people in this city, this seaport city that was known for communication, that was known for trade. All right, so now we know a little bit about the recipients. Let's talk about the time frame, okay? Acts 17, we talked about. Here's what we believe. This was either Paul's first book or his second book. It, we don't know for sure. It was either this book or the book of Galatians. But this was among, we can safely, like I wouldn't stand and say this was definitely his first book or definitely his second. But we know that this is one of his first books, okay? And let's see the circumstances. We want to talk about what do we know about the circumstances of the person writing? What do we know about the circumstances of the recipients? Paul is writing to a church that is likely three months to 12 months old. This is a baby church. You know, like this is just, this has grown to be like a really, really giant small group. And Paul is writing to give them some instruction. Here's something else we know about First Thessalonians. If you want a really good picture of the end times, you're going to go to the book of Revelation. You're going to go to the book of Daniel. If you go to the book of Daniel and Revelations, you're going to get a little confused. But read it slow and read it again and again, and you're going to get a good picture, right? But listen. First Thessalonians is such a beautiful explanation of what we call eschatology. Everyone say eschatology. Eschatology is just a fancy word of saying the study of, of last things. It's the study of end times. So Paul is giving this new church a beautiful picture of what it's going to be like at the end. Okay, so let's, here's something else we know. Paul Paul firmly believes, as do most of the disciples that followed Jesus, as did a lot of his churches, they believed that Jesus was probably going to come back in their lifetime. And why wouldn't they? You know, Jesus ministered for three and a half years on earth. He died. He rose again. He spent a few weeks on this earth, and he said, I'm coming back. Like, we have hindsight where we can look thousands of years later, but they're looking at this saying, Paul said that those of us who are alive and remain shall be caught up to, together with him in the clouds, and so shall we be with him. Those who are alive and remain, like, in their minds, as they're reading this letter, they firmly believe Jesus is coming back, and he's probably coming back in our lifetime. So, man, all the more reason to feel that intensity, to feel that 
push and a desire to live lives that are ready, ready for whatever comes our way on this earth and ready for that next life on the other side, right? So Paul is, is encouraging them, Jesus is coming again. Listen, let me encourage you. Like Peter said, remember, God is not slack concerning his promises as some think, but he is faithful to do what he said. So listen, Jesus said he's coming back, whether he comes back today or two years from now or 200 years from now, it doesn't matter. The truth is he's coming back. So what does that mean for us? To live our lives that are where we're ready. So the purpose of the letter, he's writing to encourage them. But listen, he's writing them to live, to encourage them to live lives consistent with the teaching of Jesus. Listen to that again. Live lives that are consistent with the teaching of Jesus. If the way that you live your life is inconsistent with the way that Jesus taught and lived his life, he doesn't change. We do. And that's what he's encouraging them. He's encouraging them to serve others and to work hard. That's a theme we're going to see in this book, too, that he encouraged people to be diligent and hard workers. And he encouraged them about things concerning future and end times. So what's the significant for us? <clears throat> the significance for us is we need all of that. Like uh, all the same things that they dealt with, persecution, like we may, I mean, truthfully, I, I've never really been persecuted for anything I believe. I've been teased, I've been mocked and made fun of for things I believe, but I've never been persecuted. But I just want you to know there could be a day that we face that. There really actually could be a day here in America where that could happen. And I want to live my life ready. So I choose now. Like, I choose to make my stand. I plant my feet planted that if that comes, if that type of persecution were to come in our country, as it is in other countries, like the missionary we had last Sunday, guys, like, he's been run out of countries for his faith. We, we have heard, we've heard from a missionary who was beaten and locked up in a cargo container for preaching the gospel. You know, like, stuff we can't fathom. But are we that exempt? Couldn't it happen? It could happen. And so Paul is exhorting the people because it was happening to them. It could happen to us. So let's live our lives so ready in such a way that no matter what comes our way, our feet are firmly planted. We know who we are. We know who we serve. So we're going to talk this morning. Man, I'm talking fast a little bit. Y'all ready? Y'all with me? All right. We're going to talk about virtues of a vibrant church. This first, this first chapter is beautiful so many of Paul's writings, if you read it, 1 Corinthians, for instance. <laughs> 1 Corinthians, Paul's having a right to these people because, because people were proud that they were allowing awful people in their church. Like some dude was sleeping with his mother-in-law, I believe. And the people are like, look how good and noble we are. We even have people this bad in our church. Like some of Paul's letters are, are him like verbal spanking people, you know, like, you're a bunch of fools. Stop doing stupid things. But this is such a beautiful book of encouragement. And so I'm so excited. Virtues of a vibrant church. Man, that's what I want us to be. I want to, and I, that's what I believe we are. And that's where I believe we're going is we're going to, we're a vibrant church. Listen, a vibrant church, you can have a group of 70 people and still be a vibrant church. Now, listen, I don't want us to stay a group of 70 people. I want us to be a group of 80 people, 90 people, 100 people, not because I need people here so that I feel like I'm doing a good job, though it does help. I'm just telling you the truth, okay? But because souls, like people are souls, you know? And so we want this to be a vibrant, healthy church. Why else would we preach a sermon series called Oikos where we're talking about reaching your relational world for Christ? That's why we do a sermon series called On Mission in the Fall, where we're teaching you that the world out there is waiting. They're waiting to hear about Jesus. They're waiting for you to be the Jesus, to the, be the light in their world. That, like, that's what we want. We want to be a vibrant church. So let's talk right here. First, Corinthians, First Thessalonians chapter 1, a praiseworthy trio. This is such a neat thing. Let me read verse 2 and 3 for you. It says, 
We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the first place that we see um, that we see sequentially, chronologically, where Paul uses this beautiful triad of faith, hope, and love. We read about that in 1 Corinthians 13 over and over again. Paul alludes to faith, hope, and love, these, this praiseworthy trio. And so he's encouraging the people there, and I'm encouraging us to have a faith that functions. Everyone say functions. How many of you, especially ladies, you'll understand this probably more than the men, have you ever bought an item of clothing that had fake pockets? Oh, my word, I know. Listen, if you want to talk about equality and gender, let's talk about pocket equality because that's where I'm at, pocket equality. Because if you've ever bought clothing that had fake pockets, like these don't even have, they weren't even nice enough to give me fake pockets in these. They're just no pockets at all. Fake pockets are worthless. It's a worthless use of fabric, of thread. They serve no function. They only taunt you. You know, like you go to put something in it, and you're like, oh, that's right. There's nothing there. It is faith. Paul is encouraging them to have faith that functions, not like a fake pocket. You know what I mean? Like faith that actually serves a function that does something instead of just wasting space, wasting time. Their faith was more than something to be spoken of, more than something to be looked upon. They had faith that did something, that served a function. Okay, let me just give you an example of faith that functions. Faith that functions. I can say that I believe in God to provide for my every need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Amen. I can say that, but if I don't write out my tithe check, my words are like an empty, po a fake pocket. You know, I can say that I believe that prayer works, but if I don't start praying big prayers, it's a fake pocket. It's, it's faith that doesn't function. A year ago, guys, a year ago last month, Lonnie and I had been praying. We knew the Lord was leading us. We knew he was moving us on. Faith that functioned was scary because faith that functioned in our life looked an awful lot like me writing a resume and sending it to some guy named Paul Shepherdly in Washington, Missouri. Like, I didn't know who he was. I didn't know where Washington, Missouri was. I didn't know where Union was. But faith that functioned hit send on that email with an attachment with my resume. Faith that functioned looked an awful lot like us patching holes in our walls and fixing up things so that we could sell a house. Do you know what I'm saying? Faith that functioned is it's more than just lip service. The people in Thessalonica, they had faith that functioned. And Paul is commending them for their faith that actually worked. I want to ask you, maybe there's something in your life that the Lord is spoken to you about and he keeps speaking to you about yet you just haven't pulled the trigger and done that thing yet. It could be, listen, it could be writing a book. Like some of you guys have stories, right? Some of you have got stories. If the Lord's told you, man, I want you to write a book, start the book. If he's told you he wants you to start a ministry, if he's told you he wants you to go talk to your neighbor, do that thing that he's told you to do. Have faith that actually functions more than a fake pocket. Okay. What else does he say? He talks about hope. He talks about hope that endures. He talks about having hope that hangs on, hope that holds on. Their hope produced endurance. Their hope in the Lord produced faith and endurance that they could hold on no matter what happened. We talked last um, in December about what hope was. It's the confident expectation of good even in the absence of anything that may look good. It's more than optimism. It's believing that good is coming. Listen, hope that hangs on for us might look like us believing like that Jesus is actually coming back. So no matter what's coming at me, he's coming back to get me. And so I'm going to have hope that hangs on no matter what's going on around me. No matter how bad things look with sickness, I got hope. I got hope more than in this life. Because what does he say in the Bible? If my hope is only in this life, 
I am of all men most miserable. If my hope is only for this life, that's trash, Corey, isn't it? If my hope is only for this world, it is a wasted, empty hope. I have hope that the Lord is coming back. And I just wonder what you're hoping for. I wonder what you're waiting for. Bill, I was thinking this week, if you were asleep, now you're awake because I just called your name. I was thinking about this week, and I can't remember her name, but when we went to church together in Illinois, there was a woman in the church. She had, I know where she lived. I could take you to her house, but I can't remember her name. She had prayed for her husband for years and years and years. I mean, it had, I, had, I had only heard stories about the man that I think they had lost a, a child, and I think that caused him to turn away from the Lord. She prayed for years, and I still remember when her husband came to know Jesus. Like, this woman had hope that hung on and that waited and kept praying and praying for that lost loved one. So let me just tell you, listen, if you got somebody that you're praying for, have hope that holds on. Hang on. Hang on to the fact that God loves them more than you do. Keep praying. If you're hanging on to hope for a restored relationship with a child or a loved one, man, hold on. Have hope that holds on. What else do they say? He says, have love that labors. He talked about your love. They had love that labored. In the Greek, listen, there's two cool words. You ready for this to learn something smart? Okay, good. The word is ergon and kopos. Everyone say ergon. Kopos. Okay. And now because I'm not a Greek scholar, I could be mispronouncing them, but you aren't a Greek scholar either, so you don't know, and we could all be doing it wrong together. But both of these words are words that are used in relation to labor or work. So they're interchangeable. Ergon and kopos. And let me explain what ergon is. Ergon would be like a pleasant and stimulating work. It's like you broke a good sweat. You know that, that feeling? Like you did something good. You cleaned, your, you cleaned your cabinets that are nasty and that grease all over them. Like, you know what I mean? Like you did something that was hard. You broke a sweat a little bit, but it was good. It was stimulating work. And then you've got kopos, okay? Kopos is, implies toil. It implies, implies strenuous and sweat producing. So one, ergon is, it's labor, but it's fulfilling labor. The other, it's labor, and it's excruciating, it's tiring. Okay, so if you're fragile, just plug your ears, because I'm going to say something right now, okay? I'm serious. If you're fragile and easily like, oh, my goodness, just don't listen to what I'm about to say. The most practical way I can explain this, if you've ever struggled with infertility, you'll understand. It took, it took a lot of ergon to produce our first two babies. And it took major copos to deliver those first two, for all three babies. Does that make sense? It was ergon making those babies. Okay, am, is this okay? It was Aragon making those babies, but more, man, it was Copos delivering those babies. One is a pleasant sort of work. The other is exhausting. This is what Paul is saying to the people. He's saying that you have love that labors. And let me just tell you, loving some people, man, that's Aragon. That's like, I can love you and you're easy to love, you know? And then there are other people who's like, oh, this was Copos to love you. This is so difficult to love some people. Do it anyways, right? So are are y'all okay that I use that example? Or is anyone going to faint? Does anyone need smelling? <laughs> you need spelling salts, do you? Like, I know some people are fragile, but man, listen, the, the Bible uses some real earthly, earthy analogies. Let, like, we should just kind of get over some of our fragility, right? So, Aragon and Kopos, they had love that labors. And sometimes in the body of Christ, we're not exempt from this. Some people are really easy to love, and some people are harder to love, and yet we do it anyways. We keep loving. We keep doing the hard things. Sometimes those hard things are making calls. Sometimes those hard things are making meals for people. Keep doing it. Listen, because the love that they had was so vibrant, it was so real, that Paul, I'm, I'll get to that in a minute, he their faith, their love, their labor was talked about all over Macedonia and Achaia. Like not little cities, not even just Thessalonica, but their lives, people talked about them in these two huge regions because news spreads and good news spreads too, right? 
Okay, so we talked about this, this praiseworthy trio, virtues of a vibrant church. What else is the vibrant inhabitants of the church? Who inhabits the church? Who is it? Let's read 1 Thessalonians 1, 4 through 7. For we know, brothers and sisters loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you, not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all believers in Macedonia and Achaia. Listen, the, the vibrant inhabitants, something we need to keep in mind is that it's believers over building. Believers over building. The church isn't a building. This is a shell. This is just a shell. You can do church in a parking lot somewhere. There's cowboy church. There's all kinds of different ways of doing church. The thing to keep in mind it is that it's believers over building. Y'all know something? This is crazy. Churches have split over the color of carpet. That's trash. That's nonsense. That's not kingdom-minded. That's crazy human thinking. Churches have split over the color of paint on walls. Business meetings have become contentious because people held on to pews over padded seats. Who cares, right? Believers over building. I'm not saying that we should just have a big old shack and throw some straw on the ground. But listen, if that's what we had, throw some straw on the ground and let's still do church, you know? So believers over building. And what else does he call them? He calls them brothers and sisters. So it isn't even just believers. He's calling these people that he, three weeks. He spent three weeks with these people and he calls them brothers and sisters. Man, I want you to know that <clears throat> I had a family member who would use this phrase all the time. She, she'd always say, blood's thicker than water. Blood's thicker than water. I, whatever. I don't care about the viscosity, the, the, the thickness of, of blood versus water. But what I do know is that I've had church people that were more family to me than that woman was. I hate to admit that because... Because she wasn't just like some distant aunt. But I've had church people who loved me better than that woman did. Like, that's painful, you know. But, but he calls them brothers and sisters. Like, we can become that vibrant church where we learn to look at one another, not as just a person that we go to church with, but that you are my brother. Bill, you're my brother, you know. Like, I'm your sister, I don't have to compete with you. You know, I don't have to compete with you for dominance or authority because you're my brother. Let me just say this as a woman pastor. This is tough. This is tough because this is a male-dominated field. I mean, we can be honest, right? Like, I, you know, I'm, I'm not some grand feminist who's coming up here waving a bra around in the air. Like, I'm not that girl, okay? I, I'm not that girl, but listen, I also, like, I don't have to do that, you know? Like, I don't have to beat the drum for equality except for pockets. But I don't have to do that because what I can recognize is that you're my brother, Brent. I, like, Pastor Paul, he's my boss, yeah, but he's my brother, you know? I don't have to fight for, for equality in the kingdom, because I think that's a, a silly thought. Because I want to acknowledge that, Bobby, you're my brother. I'm your sister, right? Now, brothers and sisters get in fights. I, I, got, I had two sisters. And I knew how to, I knew how to use a, a hairbrush as a weapon, you know. I knew how to throw myself on the bed and start kicking my legs like a crazy woman. Because my sister was tough. I, so, so even in the church, even in the body of Christ, we might have fights. We might have fights about the color of the paint on the walls, you know? But at the end of the fight, Patrick, you're still my brother. You know? I'm still your sister. 
You know what I'm saying? Like, we're going to learn. And that is, I say that on purpose. We're going to have to learn. If we're going to be a healthy and a vibrant church, we're going to learn to love each other like brothers and sisters and forgive. I've been in some big old fights with my sisters. I've been in some fights. They're probably going to listen to this tomorrow or this week. I've been in some fights with my sisters where we didn't talk for a few weeks or a few months. I've been in those places. But listen, they're still my sisters. We're, we still, we're going to make up. We're going to cool off. We're going to get over ourselves, and we're going to make up because we're sisters in the Lord. My daddy's done some things. He's made me mad. I've made him mad. He's still my daddy, you know? Does that make sense? Okay, let's move on from this. Believers, not buildings. Impo imitators, not imposters. He's talking to the people. Listen to this. He calls the inhabitants of the house should be people that imitate the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what he says that they did in verse, in verse 1, right? 1 Corinthians 11, 1. He says, follow me, my example, as I follow Christ. He says here, you became imitators of us and the Lord. You became imitators of us. Paul, Silas, and Timothy, you imitated what we did, and you imitated the Lord. Now, someday, back, I used to hear this word, this verse, Paul would say, follow me as I follow Christ. And I'm just going to tell you, someday I'm going to have to apologize to the Apostle Paul for all the things that I used to think about him. Because reading it in my own natural way, it sounds arrogant. It sounds a little bombastic. Follow me as I follow Christ. But man, listen, these people didn't know Jesus. They didn't, they didn't meet Jesus on a road to Damascus. They didn't know Jesus. What they knew of Jesus is what Paul represented of Jesus. So like a father who is walking through the snow with the big man feet that my husband has, as he's walking through the snow, he's laying footprints ahead for our children to follow in. If you're going through safari and you're walking through the jungle and your guide has a machete and they're whacking down the brush ahead of them, what are they doing? They're clearing a path for you. That's what Paul is saying. He's saying, I'm clearing a path for you. So the things that I am doing, I'm living my life so exemplary. I'm living my life. I'm an imitator of Jesus. Therefore, you can be an imitator of me. So by you imitating me, you imitate Jesus. And man, that's a question for me. If you are imitating me, are you imitating Jesus? Only if I'm imitating Jesus, you know? So they live their lives in such a way and I, like, I just want to plug small group here again. Listen, if you're sitting at a table with a bunch of people in your small group and you're walking through a really hard thing and you see how somebody else walked through a hard thing, man, it's like you're saying, follow me as I follow Christ. Do you see the way I, do you see the way I handled grief? Follow me as I follow Christ, right? All right. Imitate the Lord. Let's look at one other thing there. Presence, not performance. Of the vibrant inhabitants of the church. Believers, not buildings. Imitators, not imposters. And presence, not performance. Listen, Paul's reminding them that we did, they didn't come to, ca to town as the three amigos doing the God show, right? He's saying, we didn't come to you like the three amigos, Paul, Silas, and, and Timothy. Like, we weren't doing the God show. We came to town with the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. He's reminding them that it wasn't about performance. It wasn't about the sparkle. It was about the substance. It was about the Holy Spirit, the message that they preach through the Holy Spirit. What does he say in verse 5? God, the gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. It's like he's saying the Holy Spirit was our road manager. We, like, we rolled into town. The Holy Spirit was our road manager. He went ahead of us. He laid the groundwork. And then as we got there, we did everything through the road manager. And as we leave, the road manager stand behind because he's going to help you. Because that's how the Holy Spirit works, isn't it? You cannot fake a performance long. So, uh, listen. <clears throat> um, a minister. There are ministers that can get up and in their own strength because they are charismatic speakers, because they are good with people, they're good with words, they can get up and they can dazzle crowds for a certain amount of time. 
but shine will wear off. Listen, you can take a white pony and paint stripes on it, but someday the paint's going to wear off and you're still left with a white pony. And it's good if you want a white pony, but if you want a zebra, that's very bad, right? So listen, it's, it's the presence of the Holy Spirit, not the performance. So like when our worship team is up here, it's not about performance. It's not about do you sing perfect all the time? Can you play everything perfect? We want excellence, don't we? Like you don't want us to put a bunch of clowns up here. You don't want, you don't want the, the sea rung from American Idol up here, you know? Like you want the best that we've got, and we, we're giving you good worship people up here. But, man, they're not coming to you with performance. They're coming to you with the presence of the Holy Spirit. What else? When the presence is with us, listen, what does he talk about? He talks about joy, verse 6. You welcome to the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. You welcome the message with joy given by the Holy Spirit. Listen, where the presence is, there will be a spirit of joy. Even in the, you can suffer and still have a spirit and a presence of joy. So because the spirit lives in us, listen, this blows me away every time I say it and I keep saying it. If the, if the presence of the Lord, if, if, if he inhabits the praises of his people. So listen to this, follow the line of thinking. If he inhabits the praises of his people, when I, he lives within the praises of his people. When I am walking through severe suffering, like he speaks of, when I am walking through severe suffering, and he inhabits the praises of his people, when in the midst of my severe suffering, if I begin to praise him, what did I do? I invited him into my pain. You know what I mean? Like, Brent, when your daddy died, and like two or three days later, you can be up here worshiping. You didn't have to, you don't always have to check your brain out at the door. But what did you do? You invited the presence of the Lord to partake in your suffering with you. Because he inhabits the praises of his people. So get your praise on, right? Begin to praise the Lord in the midst of the severe suffering, which is what they did. And man, where is the Lord? He's inhabiting the praise. In the middle of your pain, he can still inhabit your praises. Let's look at this last thing, and we're almost done. A victorious proclamation, the virtues of a vibrant church, right? That, that praiseworthy trio, the inhabitants of the vibrant church. But they had a victorious proclamation. So let me read verse 7 through 10. And I chose to read this section right here out of the message just because it's worded. You know, sometimes, if you've ever read some of Paul's writing, sometimes you have to read it two or three times. You've got to read it slow. And you got to read it again and again and really parse out those sentences. But in the message for this passage, it just rang so clear, so easy to comprehend. So I wanted to read this to you. He says, do you know that all over the provinces of both Macedonia and Achaia, believers looked up to you? The word has gotten around. Your lives are echoing the master's word, not only in the provinces, but all over the place. The news of your faith in God is out. We don't even have to say anything more. You're the message. People come up and tell us how you received us with open arms, how you deserted the dead idols of your old life so you could embrace and serve God, the true God. They marvel at how expectantly you await the arrival of his son, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescued us from certain doom. Listen, what's our proclamation? We stay on message. Stay on message. Let me ask, this is a weird question, so listen close. Do you know what a, <laughs> I, just can't, I just get my face straight. Do you know what a lying dog-faced pony soldier is? A lying dog-faced pony soldier no, President Joe Biden does. So let me tell you why. I'm not, I'm not going political, but just follow me here, okay? Because I do love politics, and I followed the debates. I followed the Iowa caucus. I follow that kind of stuff because I just love that. It was during one of, his, um, one of his town hall meetings. 
the man did not stay on message, which is why we have this golden insult from a politician calling this poor girl a lying, dog-faced pony soldier because he didn't stay on message. So we had four years of a president who, can you just imagine the chief of staff before President Trump got out? They're like, we do not know what he's going to say. And they couldn't, they couldn't control like they could not, he couldn't stay on message. They couldn't control the narrative because he didn't care. He was saying what he wanted. And then our president now, I, can you just imagine the people behind the scenes just praying, Lord, please help him to stay on message. Please, Lord, please, please, please. Help him to not get off track. Stay on message. We told you the four talking points. Go out there and only say the four talking points. When we don't stay on message, we get things like lying dog face pony soldier insults, okay? Now, here's where I'm going. A good sword has a point, so I've got a point here, okay? We want to be people who stay on message. Now, what's going to happen is the enemy wants to take us off message. The enemy wants us to get caught up into arguments about things that don't matter, that's what he wants. And listen, he gets his way so many, many times. The enemy wants us to argue about health care. There there's a time and a place to do that, but I'm not going to argue that here. Like if I'm witnessing to somebody, if I'm, if I'm sitting down and having a good Jesus conversation with someone, I'm not going to talk to them about pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib. I'm not going to get caught up on, on dro doctrines that um, are not going to get me to heaven or send me to hell. Does that make sense? Are you with me? You with me? Okay. He wants to get us off message by getting us focused on little things like masks, no mask, vaccine, no vaccine. He wants to get us fighting over homeschool is best, public school is best. And listen, these new tr this is just this is not a new trend. The argument about mask, no mask, mandate, no mandate, like it's just second verse, same as the first, because back in the 80s, you know, back in the 80s and 90s, it was about public school, Christian school, homeschool. Like people have fought over just all these different things. Here's what I'm saying. I'm not saying you shouldn't have a stance, and I'm not saying some things, some issues are important. I'm, I think issues are important. Like we've made our choice on what we did for school. We, we made our own choices on what we did for vaccines and masks. Okay, I don't fight with anyone over those things. So there is a time and a place to have the conversations. But when I say, let's be on message, here's what I'm saying. Don't let the enemy, when you're, when you're having a conversation with someone who doesn't know Jesus, don't let the enemy try to take you down some stupid rabbit trail that doesn't lead to fruitful conversations. So listen, what is message? Message is the gospel. God, our sins, paying everyone life. The staying on message, it might be something as simple as God loves you and wants to have a relationship with you. So when, listen, I was having a great conversation with someone months ago, and they wanted to talk about baptism. Baptism's important, but I'm not going to fight with someone over baptism. You know, they, were, they wanted to talk about speaking in tongues and like, I believe, I, you're a pastor, I speak in tongues, but I'm not going to fight with you over that. And this person so badly wanted to take me down that trail, and over and over I'd be like, oh, man, Jesus loves you. He wants a relationship with you. I kept staying on message, I once was lost, but now I'm found. You can be found. You know what I mean? So, like, stay on message, and that's what the Thessalonians were doing. They stayed, they knew the message, they stayed on message. What else did they do? They stayed on mission. Message and mission, man, they stayed on mission. They knew the purpose of the church was to reach the lost, not just to comfort the, the comfortable, right? The, the mission of the church is to reach the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. But listen, I can tell you as a pastor, there have been seasons of ministry where I've been exhausted doing the work that wasn't the mission. I've been exhausted doing programs that wasn't missional. I, you know what I mean? I, I want to be a church. I want us to stay on mission. So if someone comes to me and they're like, man, I got a good idea for a new ministry, I'm going to listen to that. I'm going to listen. I want to sit down. I want to hear your thoughts and ideas. But if it's not on mission, if it's all it's going to do is make me busier, I'm not about that. 
y'all don't have time to do that, do you? Like, let's figure out what the mission is. Let's stay on mission. A vibrant church stays on mission. What else? The last thing, they lived out loud. Worship team, if you guys want to come out, come on up. Their victorious proclamation, they stayed on message. They stayed on mission. And what the last thing is they lived out loud. <clears throat> they turned from idols, the Bible said. It says they, you turned from idols and you turned to God. So what we know about their culture, what we know about this Greco-Roman culture is that they were a pluralistic society. It means that they worshipped many different gods. Some of the gods they, they worshipped um, were Di Dionysus, Aphrodite, Zeus. They worshipped the god of medicines. They worshipped the god of physicians. But what is he saying? Paul is telling them that, that your faith, we've heard about you all over the place. So if you look at a map, if you go in the back of your Bible, if you've got a good study Bible, you'll have a map in there. And there's lots of different titles in your maps. But if you go to Paul's second missionary journey, look up that. If first, second missionary journey, it won't matter. You're going to see in there the city of Thessalonica. If you look at Thessalonica and you look all around it, that's the area, that's the region of Macedonia. It's huge. And then you look under it. It's this whole region of Achaia. This baby church, three to 12 months old, their, their lives shouted out so much that people all over this region heard about what they were doing. They heard about the way that they were living their lives because they lived out loud. What did he say in verse 9? You deserted the dead idols of your old life so you could embrace and serve God, the true God. I want you to know you cannot embrace God and your idols. Like your arms aren't big enough and God's not going to hang in that embrace. You know what I mean? Like if I can embrace both my girls at the same time. But listen, if I'm trying to embrace God and hug my idols over here, God's slipping right out of that hug. He's not going to, he's not a part of that hug. And man, idol, idolatry, their idolatry looks a lot different than ours. Our idolatry really looks a lot like what we do with our time and what we do with our money, doesn't it? Like, I, I doubt that any of you have a shrine in your home. If you do, let's talk. <laughs> but I don't think any of you probably have some corner that is set up with some shrine that you bow down to every day and worship. But, but it's easy to worship our TV. Like that can be a shrine, can't it? Our, check, our checking account can become a shrine. It can become that thing that we idolize and that we worship if we're not careful. We lay down our idols. And why did people notice? Listen, people notice something going against the grain, don't they? Only a dead salmon is going to flow in the same direction of the current, right? A living salmon's going to swim the other way. A dead salmon flows in the same direction. Man, it's time to, to like flow in a different direction, isn't it? If we want to be a vibrant, vibrant church, if we want to be vibrant people, one, one thought that he said in that passage, he says, your lives echoed the master's word. Your life, he didn't say your mouths echoed the master's words. He said your lives echoed the master's words. That's that idea of living out loud. Yes, speak. There are going to be moments where you're going to need to speak. We're going to share the gospel and the love of Jesus. But man, your life and the way you live, the way you treat somebody, the way you treat someone when you're bumped up against, like that can echo the master's word. That can echo and imitate the love of Jesus. And I think that's where, where we're going to close this morning. I'm going to invite you to stand with me. First, I just want to ask you, are you, except for y'all, don't be standing, you two. First, are you living a vibrant Christian life? A vibrant Christian life. Do you have faith that functions? Do you have hope that hangs on? Do you have love that labors and serves and gives? Are you a faithful inhabitant of the house? Like, man, church attendance is, is super important. Are you a faithful member of the house? Like, when some of you are gone, man, I notice. Like, Rick and Sherry, I hope you're watching. Like, that spot looks really bare and empty where you are, Corey, because that's their spot. Now, listen, 
people that are watching at home online right now because of health concerns, you're never going to hear me criticize you, not even once, because we all are walking different journeys. We, some of us are taking care of elderly people. Some of us are in um, heavy exposure to COVID. There's not an ounce of criticism in that. But what I want to say is some people, some people, it is time to come back. It's, it's easy to do church and PJs, isn't it? Like that's the easy way. But being a part of a family, you got to show up. You got to show up. So listen, I just want to encourage you. We're going we're gonna to end with a, a worship song, a time of prayer. Our worship team's going to lead us in this song. And I just want to encourage you to, to come forward. If you've got a need, if you've got something that you're walking through in your own life, let's come and pray. And as you see somebody up here, come pray with them. Let's be people who are willing to lay hands on somebody and pray. So we're going to do that in a second. We're going to have them sing. And then I'm going to come back and close us out in prayer. Are you ready to do that and pray with me? Let's do it. <laughs> 